this. So, and especially experienced and you know, qualified policy officers and, and policy developers know that the economy can't be circular in that biophysical sense. So the point of departure for this talk is rather to say then that, well, when we are studying the development of policies for the circular economy, we shouldn't take for granted that it's the biophysical meaning that is the only one, that the expression, the circular economy, clearly can mean something else than, materially speaking, an economy that is perfectly circular. So um, what does the circular economy mean, really? Um, there's this wonderful paper by Julian Kircher and, and, and co-authors that analyzes the concept and, and concludes that there are 114 definitions. And we're going to uh, comfort you already now that we're not going through all those definitions. <laughs> it's an interesting paper, though. And another video. And perhaps. another video, perhaps, yes. Uh, but what are we to say of, of the concept of the circular economy? Is this where you take over this, the slides? This very much depends on what the next slide is. Yes. <laughs> no, this uh, I can also, Absolutely. yes, yeah. Right, so uh, we, uh, for those of you who have uh, watched our webinar video on Nexus governance itself, you, you may remember that um, we discussed that the whole concept of the Nexus actually can be interpreted in different ways. You know, we are, are we talking about the, the linkages between water, energy, and food in the real material world out there, uh, as it were? Or are we talking about the interconnections and interlinkages between different policy realms and the challenges they are faced with? And for instance, how to reconcile policy targets across policy domains? And uh, this, we believe, is, is very much interesting in, uh, with regard to circular economy. So, Whereas the, the, the first video was about, let's say, the green square here, the biophysical processes, uh, the main focus of what we have to, to say today, um, and also the main focus of this book that we are there to uh, recommend, even though we wrote it ourselves, uh, The Circular Economy in Europe, uh, is uh, the development of circular economy policies. By the way, this book is, uh, we're there to recommend it because it's open access and can be downloaded uh, for free on. Routledge's uh, internet website and also from, from Amazon. Yes, so I think the interesting point here is, whereas in this definitions and this kind of idea that this economy cannot be circular, uh, it seems circularity, circularity as a concept seems to be taken for granted. And what we want to add here now is this idea that circular economy has been a policy in the making over the last eight years or so. And so on this slide, you see a little description of the development of the circular economy and how uh, kind of it included ever more policy proposals, uh, policy papers and different kinds of things, like starting very much from, from waste management to becoming this full-fledged uh, environmental economic sets of different policies. And in the process, of course, also the meaning of circularity was changed and reshaped. And so when we say how circularity is imagined, it's very important that when we talk about imagination, it's of course not uh, mere fantasies of individual people, but imagination is something collectively shared and institutionally stabilized. And so what's being stabilized is particular ideas of how the world is, also crucially how the world ought to be. So, and consequentially, what actions to take to achieve how the world ought to be. So imagination in that sense is a collective practice of describing and remaking worlds. And in that sense, the ways in which uh, political actors imagine circularity has severe consequences. So, in that sense, talking about imagining circularity is talking about um, desirable futures and only some of those desirable futures will be realized at the expense of others. And so when talking about imagination and how different meanings of circularity, Roga already mentioned um, the Sankey diagram as a particular way of imagining this. And 
this graph here comes from, is another, just another example, which comes from uh, the Al MacArthur Foundation. And we see here the distinction between the technosphere and the, the biosphere, or biological nutrients and technical nutrients. And what this does, in a sense, is that it rehearses this idea of a nature culture divide and tries to, whereas culture and um, the technosphere, so to say, tries to mimic nature. And in turn, when, when you look at uh, imagination and when you look at circularity in this way, this kind of produces a nature in need of production and um, engineering sciences and natural sciences as providing solution for environmental problems. So you have here a discourse of restoration and protection and crucially then techno fixes as solutions. So in that sense, imagination becomes consequential. And in our work, we distinguished kind of four sets of different policy narratives um, looking at the circular economy. And there is the overall justification in the sense that the circular economy is desirable because it can promote sustainable growth. There are visions of increased recycling and better waste management, visions of repair and reuse, to reuse together with the culture of sharing economy, and also expectations of consent. So, and what we also wanted to spend a little time on, the question is, how little time do we still have? Oh, we have uh, quite a lot of time still, I think. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, one imagination and uh, how the circular economy looks like takes place in very different sites. And one of those sites, we think, is indicator development. That is, how is it actually measured if or when we're going to achieve circularity? And so looking at these uh, indicators, which is kind of a collaborative effort by different director generals in the European Commission, who are leading by, by DG Estat or Eurostat, and together with the DG Environment, DG Grow, and DG Climate Action. So this is a collaborative effort of different people discussing how to measure progress towards the circular economy. And so when we just look at the overall headings of what counts or how, what do we actually achieve? What is counted as circularity? So we have production and consumption, waste management, secondary raw materials, and uh, competitiveness and innovation. And especially the last one, I think, is a good example of this very deeply ingrained idea that we will achieve circularity and that we can kind of solve environmental challenges by producing enough patents. So I think that's very clear nice way to show how traditional ideas of policy making are perpetuated through the circular economy. And there has been already criticism that these indicators focus too much on waste management and that they have blind spots in regards to production consumption and especially in regards to reuse and repair because kind of sharing economies and reuse and repair practices are very hard to measure. Then there's also criticism that uh, there's some lamp posting involved that you kind of measure these things where you have data available. So you measure stuff that's easy to measure. Um, and on a somewhat kind of deeper level, there's even the question, so what's actually understood by the term sharing economy? So is this kind of companies like Airbnb and Uber? And what might be the downsides of promoting companies like that? So and Besides thinking about uh, what are the actual categories in which we measure circularity and how we imagine circularity, there's of course also the more kind of intricate questions of what is actually measured that goes into these indicators. And for example, uh, weight measure, uh, waste can be measured by weight, uh, by the critical raw materials that go in it, and also by hazardous materials. And the focus so far has been on weight and rare materials. And this is kind of focus guided by a focus on security of supply, self-sufficiency sufficiency and sovereignty. And the interesting thing here is that um, we see that how circularity gets imagined through those indicators of measuring waste is closely tied to other ideas about the European Commission as a collective which is security of supply self-sufficiency. 
So ideas of circularity are closely related to other ideas about the European Commission and how we, how the European Commission sees itself as a collective. And I think uh, summarizing these couple of slides about imagining circularity and uh, indicators is that to say that um, it's important to look at these imaginations because even if they have very good intentions, they want to achieve more circularity or as colleagues from the uh, European Environment Agency said, at least nobody wants to be less circular. So even if there are good intentions, it's important to be very careful about which previous ideas are perpetuated and if they might even be harmful. Robert, back to you. So um, in, in the Magic Nexus project, we were very interested in analyzing the circular economy policies as we saw them as an instance of, of nexus policies. Um, yes, they deal with water, energy, and food, but, but more fundamentally, they address, uh, we can see them as an instance of, of uh, policies that address concerns from separate policy domains, in this case, environmental sustainability and, and, and also economic growth, and no, no less so with the uh, prominence that the circular economy takes in, in the European Green Deal. Um, and it does so in a way that we can recognize from, from other such instances by uh, resolving tensions, by offering win-win solutions, um, and thereby uh, uh, intending to avoid painful uh, trade-offs. And to start to summarize a little bit, it does so by addressing environmental concerns that warned about limits to growth uh, fundamentally some decades ago. And then by translating these concerns into what we could call an optimistic narrative of innovation and growth, um, yes, we can. It, it, it is possible to fix this. Uh, and in this way, we see uh, a notion of the circular economy, not so much as the circular economy that cannot exist in the mindset of, of let's say, ecological economics, but rather as um, a trajectory towards business opportunities, eco-design, green public procurement, eco-products, patents, innovations, things that can be done in a way and, and, uh, and pursued. And also, as it was already explained by Thomas, um, this is implemented in a way that where uh, metrics and targets will be chosen that fit these imaginations, but also sometimes vice versa in the sense that um, Metrics and targets may be chosen because uh, this is what we have available as data. And that, again, feed, feeds back into the imaginations of what is desirable uh, uh, on the level of policy. Um, it is not our point to say that there is anything bad with this. This is probably the way that policy will have to be developed and, and, and governance will be developed. And uh, rather, our point has been to show that um, it's interesting to discuss the many meanings of the circular economy and also because this is not a stabilized concept as of yet. So in the future, we will see how the different opportunities will play out for what exactly will be the content of the circular economy. And we think that you know, policymakers, but also citizens and, and entrepreneurs, etc., will, will have their possibility of shaping that concept. Perhaps in order to try to in a way, reconcile or, or at least um, juxtapose the uh, perspective conveyed by the first video on the circular economy with, with this one, it's also interesting to ask, okay, but uh, what can go wrong then when the circular economy policies ultimately will have to be connected to the biophysical processes? So what could possibly go wrong? Well, what could possibly go wrong is that um, when metrics and targets indicators, uh, policy content, action content in action plan, uh, action plans are are uh, populated uh, in a way by virtue of their own dynamics and what is possible in the policy nexus, um, one may end up not choosing metrics and targets that, from the point of view of sustainability sciences, would appear as very important. And in that way, it may be that relevant knowledge uh, and relevant concerns from the sustainability sciences about the limits to growth will not be able to uh, 
um, flow into policy and governance and be translated into it. And this might sound overly abstract, but to give it a, a very concrete example, again, thinking back on the coupling of the biosphere and the technosphere, perhaps if one, many of these indicators are, that are being chosen uh, for circularity rather reside within the technosphere. So it's a matter of, of how much are we able to recycle within the technosphere of what Mario Gian Pietro called the, the secondary and tertiary flows. Whereas from the point of view of sustainability science, perhaps the most important thing is to have an eye on, on the primary flows and the possibility of the regeneration of what is giving, what, what is ultimately the source of these flows, which are uh, ecological funds. There is a lot to discuss about this, and, and uh, we're looking very much forward to our uh, interactive sessions to hear what, what you think about this and, and, and what are the opportunities and how could we sort of come together and, and uh, co-create uh, a content of, of circular economy policies that would be both, say, transforming our societies into real sustainability uh, uh, and at the same time being realistic and achievable in the kind of society and, and policy institutions that we have. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>